Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the service tonight. If you will, stand please. And let's sing number 16 in our hymn book. Number 16. King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid, tenderly mourned and wept. Angels in robes of light arrayed, guarded thee whilst thou slept. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me. Let me like Mary through the gloom come with a gift to thee. Show to me now the empty tomb, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee. Even the cup of grief to share, thou hast borne all for me. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me. Calvary. Let's sing one more, number 18. <clears throat> Take the name of Jesus with you. Child of sorrow and of woe, it will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where you go. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of it. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy. Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations rise, you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, oh, how sweet, hope of earth and joy of him. Precious name, oh, how sweet. Hope of earth and joy out here. Oh, the precious name of Jesus, how it thrills our souls with joy. When his loving arms receive us and his songs are to employ. Precious name, oh, how sweet. Hope of earth and joy out here. Precious name, oh how sweet, oh by birth and joy of it. At the name of Jesus bowing, falling prostrate at his feet. King of kings in heaven will crown him when our journey is complete. Precious name. Oh, how sweet, hope of earth and joy of him, precious name, oh, how 
together and start our services tonight and uh, brother Chris back there lead us in prayer please <clears throat> amen thank you you can be seated we appreciate everybody uh, just being here tonight and uh, uh, you guys are the faithful uh, uh, ones tonight Hard-shelled Baptist is what you are. Got out in that rain and came and didn't worry about melting or anything like that. So uh, I'm, I'm excited, thankful. We've got a good core here we can rely on. But uh, it was a pretty good rain and good storm there. Kind of cleaned out the ditches and uh, going to keep the grass growing a little while longer. It's been a good green summer, hadn't it? And, uh, you know, somebody said that uh, the almanac saying it's going to be a lot of snow with all this moisture. I don't know, but it'll be here before you know it, won't it? But September's coming soon, and that'll be the first the Sunday, this coming Sunday, 1st of September. And uh, we're looking forward to getting on into the month of September, all the things got going on there. But uh, we are glad that uh, you're here tonight. We had still had a good group of boys and girls come in on the buses and the vans, and uh, it's probably going to smell like a wet dog on a bus on the way home. But uh, that's all right. Won't be any problem at all. And uh, they'll dry out. They'll be okay. They, they thought it was fun, you know, to get out in that rain and that kind of thing. But uh, we are thankful. It's been good. Uh, we want you to just hope you have a bulletin. If you didn't pick up a prayer bulletin, uh, we probably have a few of those left. But on the inside, don't forget to be in prayer about the things that you see there on the, on the left side. And uh, we have several ministries and things throughout the week, not just only on Wednesday, but uh, we have a, a campus outreach, a Bible club on the campus at Ohio Southern University. And we have uh, a, a bus ministry and visitation ministry. We meet every Saturday morning, and we go out and we do that, and that's a blessing. So uh, we're just hopeful and thankful that uh, God allows us to do these things, and we hope you'll be a part of them and pray for them. Uh, at the bottom, uh, we just want to remind you about our Sunday school, and I hope everybody will be a part of that. Sunday night, if you weren't here, we preached a message on Sunday school and the second coming, Sunday school and the second coming, and uh, I believe it's very important for us to put our life under the sound of God's Word, the influence of good Bible teaching to a Sunday school now more than ever because we're living in the last days. And uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and in Hebrews chapter 10, both of those passages of Scripture deal with the second coming. And when we know we're living in the last days, what do we do? Well, uh, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, the things you knew from a little child. And, uh, you know, sometimes we equate Sunday school with children. But God said in the last days... Not to forsake ourselves together, uh, but to be faithful to attend, be in Sunday school where you can hear God's word taught and preached because uh, the devil is at work deceiving people. In 2 Timothy 3, chapter 3, verse 1, it talks about the last days are perilous times. And we, we see that word defined, and so often we take that first definition, maybe never look any further. We know that that word can be defined as savage or dangerous, but the word also means a weakening, a weakening of the things that once were strong. We're living in the day where those things which once were very strong, the devil's at work to weaken them. You remember what God said about him in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 14? He said, he said is this the one that did weaken the nations? And certainly he's doing that. And so we want to be strong, growing Christians. Be involved in a Sunday school class with your whole family. And uh, we have two good classes for adults and then classes for all ages of children, young people, young men and women, all right up through college age. 
and uh, be in Sunday school. And on the other side, we've got a whole list of names and different folks that we're praying for, and we hope that you'll just join us in prayer, praying about these things. Maybe you have something you'd like to add to our prayer list tonight. We'll jot it down on there and join you in prayer about that. Christy? <clears throat> okay. Beals. Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And what's their names? Okay. All right. Anybody else have something you want to put on there? Well, we want to be praying about these things, and we hope that you'll be praying now earnestly about our upcoming mission revival, our, our revival for world missions, which is coming up in September, and I uh, hope you'll be praying about that. It's one of the most important things we do all year because we'll determine for the next year what our monthly missions uh, budget will be, so to speak, and so we hope you'll be praying about that. I, I encourage you. Uh, you to pray and increase your faith and increase that amount each year, some a little bit each year, so that we can continue to grow and uh, help uh, reach the world with uh, the gospel. Uh, I hope you'll be here Sunday. One of the messages we want to preach, we're going to be preaching on some of the ABCs of the local church, and of course you can't get any more primary in purpose than missions and the gospel. The Great Commission, of course, has been given to the local church, and I hope that uh, I hope you'll be here. We want to preach at least one of those services on missions and the the responsibility we have, and uh, where do we begin? Where do we begin to reach every creature with the gospel? Where do we begin? Where does it begin? And I hope you'll be here and uh, and and let the Lord speak to your heart. But be praying about it, and uh, we're praying God a blessing. Just give us faith to trust Him, <clears throat> and uh, be involved in world evangelism. Anybody else have something you'd like to place on our prayer list right now tonight? All right. Well, we want to uh, ask our men to go ahead and come. We'll receive our evening tithes and offerings and our missions offerings. We'll be faithful in those areas of worshiping the Lord. Sunday, we received a special offering just to take care of some special expenses we had in the month of August that were not normal monthly things. And if you weren't here Sunday or you weren't able to give to that offering on Sunday, but you'd like to do so today, and it is a special offering for that fund you need to please just mark that as special offering. Put it in an envelope, mark special, or on your check in the uh, subject or the memo area, just write special offering or something so we'll know that that's not your regular tie, that's not your faith promise missions giving offering, that's for the special offering. So just mark that if you will. But uh, these men will pray and we'll receive our offering tonight and pray about the things we have on our prayer list. <clears throat>
Again, we're glad everybody's here. Appreciate folks coming out on Wednesday. Uh, one of the most encouraging and needed services all week. And so we're thankful that you're here. Appreciate folks who <coughs> came and went with us yesterday on our joy trip. And we went out toward Wayne, out uh, around the La Valette area, and uh, stopped at a really nice nursery. It was Blatt's. Is that the name of the place? Some of you probably have been there. But they have a really, really uh, neat little petting zoo. If any of you parents want to take your kids somewhere and just let them uh, pet some just really cute animals, friendly and uh, hungry uh, animals, uh, take them out there. They, had, they have uh, llamas or alpacas. I don't know the difference. I told our group last year we went to Peru and those animals are native in Peru. And I asked one of our folks, do you know what they call those in Peru? And I thought, I think they thought I was going to give them a Spanish lesson. And I said, they call them dinner. They eat them, what they do. But uh, uh, we know here in the States, of course, people raise them and breed them for their wool. But uh, they have some of those. They have a, they have a miniature cow. I think one even bigger than a big German Shepherd dog. And uh, they had pygmy goats, a pot-bellied pig, all kinds of chickens a rabbit, uh, he was back in his hutch back in the back and he didn't come out, but I don't, what else did they have, anything else? I think that was about it, but really interesting. Yeah, yeah, I had a chicken get out and Kathy caught it, put it back in and it just got right back out. So we didn't put it back, did we? <laughs> Left it out. But uh, very good, beautiful plants and very friendly fella in there and different things and so we enjoyed that and went up to another little uh, shop where the uh, lady uh, uh, lady uh, has a lot of gifts for uh, for anyone but primarily a lot of things for the home and personal jewelry and different things like that but very friendly very accommodating to our group but right behind there they had a bakery and had a girl there had a kitchen and had a bake shop and boy she had all kind of beautiful baked goods and different things out some of our folks got some baked goods and we had a good lunch together. So it was a, it was a great day. We appreciated the folks going with us. So if you'd ever uh, never get out and go with us on our joy trips and you're able to, you just miss out on a good time. And uh, so it's just fun to go and be a part of that. And we appreciated our men on, on sa Saturday morning. We had such a great uh, men's fellowship. Rex had 27 men out, almost 30 men. And Lord just blessed that and it's been growing. and. Uh, we're reaching some people through that meeting that uh, we don't get to reach in a church service. And uh, so our, our men are at work bringing and inviting friends, the people, and come. And so it's been good, and we've been blessed through that as well. 
I hope you'll notice there's some uh, announcements, different things, meetings and things scheduled. Uh, we've got a meeting Sunday evening right before church there with our uh, deacons and uh, our mission committee just to kind of talk a little bit about uh, our missions meeting this year, our uh, missions revival, some of these things. And then, uh, of course, the dates on our mission conference, our revival for World Mission, September 22nd through the 25th, will start on Sunday morning. And we'll have a combined Sunday school with all of our adult classes and our junior high and high school classes. And then we'll have Dr. Clayton Shumpert in. He'll be preaching for us in our services. We'll have two great missionary families with us, Brother Harold, Matt, my brother-in-law, uh, will be in. Our, our missionary that we support uh, in Peru. We'll also have Brother Justin Grinstead with us. He and his wife, April, and their family are going to be going to the country of Argentina in South America as missionaries. And uh, they'll be with us just to share God's calling upon their life and their burden for the country of Argentina. And, uh, and then the Marietta uh, Bible College Ladies Ensemble will be here on Monday night. They'll be singing for us in the service, Dr. Mrs. Geiler and the girls from the school. Uh, I've talked to Dr. Geiler several times this week. We've just been kind of calling each other back and forth. They have 90 students enrolled this year. That's the largest group of students they've ever had. He's so excited. So I'm trying to find beds and mattresses and things to put them everywhere. And, and uh, our group, our joy group, my phone rang continually yesterday, and it was missionaries. I had all kind of missionaries call me. One of them was from the Philippines who had graduated. We support Miss Grace, uh, her, her husband Christian Morales, and they're in the Philippines doing a great work. And uh, I told him about how excited Dr. Goddard was and the dilemma of trying to find places for him to sleep. And he said, oh, preacher, he said, us Filipinos said they can turn the bed around sideways and four or five of us can sleep on that bed. <laughs> he said, it won't be any problem. <laughs> so, uh, so they're excited too. But uh, we're looking forward to having a great revival meeting. And, uh, you know, our focus in this meeting is just to be uh, just for all of our church family to participate in giving to missions m monthly, faithfully, consistently, and for us all to grow in our faith some this year so that we can just continue to do what uh, the Lord has allowed us to have the opportunity to do through world evangelism. But uh, that'll, that'll be a great meeting. There's a couple things on the back you'll notice that we'll be speaking some more about on Sunday. There's a couple opportunities for each of you to be a part personally uh, in the, our mission revival. One of those ways is we like to, to provide a, a meal for our missionaries, Sunday lunch, and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday nights, we, we provide them with home-cooked meals. Most missionaries, if they're on deputation, and sometimes they're on deputation two or three years, they eat out every week, every church, time and time again, and very few times are they home and get a home-cooked meal, and they enjoy that when they come here. And we get you to help us with that. And we'll be passing that sheet around on Sunday. What we like to do is get a team of three people to provide a meal for our missionaries. And we'll explain a little bit more about it. But uh, suppose we have John sign up and uh, Miss Kathy and Andrea. All three of them sign up for the same meal. What we ask you to do is to provide a meal like you were going to provide one for your family. You would provide a meat, two vegetables, and uh, a, a dessert. And Kathy would do the same thing, and Andrew would do the same thing. So we have three meats, you've got a variety of side dishes, and you've got three desserts. And remember, you're feeding at least two or three families, so that's, that's why we need to do it that way. And uh, so when you sign up for it, I just want you to know what you're getting yourself into. And everybody always does a good job. We never have any problem with that. But we'll explain that a little bit more. But there'll be Sunday after morning services, that lunch meal, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday nights, the meal right before the services for our missionaries. It'll be Dr. And Mrs. Shumpert and Matt and his family and the Grinsteads and their family. And then if you, if you provide a meal and you're a part of that, we ask you and your family to come and eat. And we want you to be able to get to know the missionaries and uh, have a first-hand part in that. So that's something we'll do. And then we'd love, for, uh, we'd love to be able to give our missionaries uh, something a little special, maybe some gift cards, uh, fuel, gasoline, uh, 
Walmart, just different various gift cards. So if you would like to be a part of that, just pick some gift cards up and uh, we'll get them and divide them up and pass those along to our missionaries. But you can go ahead and be doing that. You can start doing that uh, now. And uh, we'll have a, a time when we ask for those and coordinate putting those all together. But that's just a couple individual projects that you can do. And I know I've told the story before, but it is such a tremendous blessing uh, to be involved in the lives of missionaries and supporting and helping them. Uh, when my wife and I first uh, began to be burdened about missions, I grew up in a church uh, that wasn't very mission-minded, never really saw a missionary, didn't really know what one was. And uh, I, uh, I married a young lady whose father was an independent Baptist preacher. They had a thriving missions ministry with real missionaries who came in and reported and served the Lord all around the world. And that church was involved in their ministries. And so as I began to get around that, I realized, hey, this is scriptural. This is the way God wants it to be done. And so I can remember going to mission conferences. But I couldn't go at my church. We didn't have one. But I went to churches that I had that were friends who pastored or were in those churches and I can remember my wife and I as a young couple. We didn't have any children, anything like that. But God just would go and we'd, our hearts would be stirred for reaching souls, for uh, thanking God for missionary couples and families who were willing to surrender to go to the mission field and, uh, and just lift them up before the Lord. But we always would pick out a family in the, in the mission conference and just try to do something special for them. We would try to buy all the kids a pair of shoes or find out something the wife needed or something the man needed. And we did this on, on our own. We didn't do it through the church. We just did it on our own. We would go and find out what do you need, what size do your children wear, and these kind of things. And we would just try to do that. What a blessing it was to give, to help in the in that family in that way. We would, we would ask them if they were doing anything after a service and take them out and buy them a pizza or something and fellowship with them, have them go home for a meal. We wanted to be a part of the missions ministry. And God maybe had not called us to the mission field, but he had called us to be their partners and support them and encourage them. And that's what we wanted to do. And I tell you, until we take it to that step, we really don't understand what a burden heart is for missions. And I, I want to be, that's, that's, the, that's kind of the topic that I want to bring a message on Sunday. Uh, the Lord wants us to do more than throw money at missionaries. He wants us to have a heart for the mission fields, the souls of men and women, boys and girls around the world, so that when we do have a mission conference or we do have missionaries, it's just a natural thing to be involved in their lives and being part of what they're doing. And uh, so I hope you'll be here on Sunday. But uh, those are some things you can do in a personal way to help missionaries. Uh, October's Roundup Month. We try to round everybody up, get them back into church from the summer and all the different things that we've had going on and be faithful to church and back involved in all of our programs and ministries. Uh, our Patch the Pirate Club, that's a brand new children's ministry that we're starting, a Bible club on Wednesday nights. That begins next Wednesday night. And uh, Brother Evan had a meeting scheduled tonight at 615 for all of you who volunteered and signed up on that sheet to help with the ministry. And uh, the rain, we're going to say, caused everybody but one person or two to forget. And uh, so we're going to reschedule that for Sunday evening or sometime there where we can get that meeting. It's vital that we have it before the program begins. And uh, so we'll be reminding you about that. But I'm excited about this program. And uh, if, I, if, I, if I weren't pastoring and preaching each Wednesday night, I'd want to be involved in that club because it's good. It's exciting. Uh, you get to wear a pirate sash, and you have uh, pirate hats and things like that, and you're learning some great songs and music and uh, great Bible stories and lessons and getting a chance to earn stars and 
ship steering wheels for your hat and all kinds of cool stuff. And uh, uh, each month we're going to have all of our pirates assemble in here and we're going to recognize their monthly achievements. They're going to sing some songs for us and then they'll dismiss and go on about their night. But uh, it's going to be a great program and we're going to do our very best to make it exciting and engaging for our children. And, uh, you know, we, if, we're in the, if we're in any type of children's ministry, we have to remember what a great privilege we have of being involved in that as a church and also what a great priority it should be uh, for us to reach young people. And uh, children, I say, often are the key to the hearts of parents and families. And if you can get a child excited and encouraged about their Sunday school class, their children's church, or their Wednesday night Bible club, they're going to encourage their parents to be faithful. And so that's what we want to do. And I think this club will help us do that in a very good way. So we're excited about that starting up. Uh, bonfire this Friday night. Uh, South Point's home football games begin, and we host a bonfire after each home football game. And our youth group and youth ministry workers go to those games, and they spend the game recruiting kids to come back to the bonfire. And uh, we usually take the vans, and if they need a ride here, we can, we'll bring them here. And uh, then we'll have a refreshment, play a game or two, but we'll have a good Bible challenge. Uh, those boys and girls will hear the gospel while they're here. And uh, we need your help with that. I think this coming uh, Friday, uh, they're doing a popcorn bar. They're going to have popcorn and all different types of toppings and things that you can put on it. So it's not going to be a, a, a real labor-intensive thing for the first one or a really financially challenging one. But now later on in the year, as these games come up, we may be asking you to help a little bit, make an investment in that ministry by giving them a donation to help with some refreshments. But uh, that starts this coming Friday night after the football game. Well, all of these things and many more are on our calendar and schedule, and we're looking forward to all of them, and we're excited about uh, this time of the year. The Lord's blessed us. We've been having good services, and folks are visiting, and, and it's just encouraging, and we're thankful for you being here tonight as well. I wonder if maybe as we, uh, as we move forward here, anybody on a Wednesday night here, you might have a verse of Scripture you read this uh, week that was an encouragement to you. Or you might have just a, a word of praise about an answered prayer or just anything that might be an encouragement and edify our fellow uh, believers here tonight. Uh, anybody have anything like that you'd like to share tonight? Amen. Yeah. And he said, I need work. And uh, his buddy was answered all through the service. He told him. And uh, the preacher gave him a call. He walked it out. Amen. Here's the buddy, 45 years old. And how the Lord blessed him. Bless the service. Amen. Let's take our Bibles again and just open them up uh, to Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes. It's uh, near the very heart of God's Word. 
and uh, it's a part of what we call, as we divide the Bible up to rightly divide and study it, uh, one of the poetic books. Poetry has to do with our hearts and speaks to our hearts, and there are five books in our Bible that we refer to as poetic, or the books that have to do with our heart, beginning with the book of Job, and uh, the book of Psalms, and Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. And we're in the heart of God's words, it's near the very middle, and in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10, finishing a message that we've spent a couple weeks on. And I want to give you the final two points of this message, and we'll move ahead. But we've been looking in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 at a key verse, verse 12. Ecclesiastes 10, the Bible says, The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. And our thought here has been the words of a wise man's mouth. And we've learned as we've read through chapter 10 that here are compared two people, the fool and the wise man. The wise man is wise because God has given him wisdom, the, the direction, the leadership of God's will and God's word and God's way. God said in the book of Isaiah, this is the way, walk ye in it. We don't have to wonder about the way God would have us to do things or live our life. He's shown them to us through his word. And the wise man follows. He lets God lead him. He makes the choices and decisions of life as God gives him discretion and direction and discernment to do. The fool does not do that. The fool disregards God. He disregards the word of God. He, he discounts that there will be a sowing to the reaping of sin. Uh, he lives like there is no God. So the wise man and the foolish man. Here in verse 12, it's talking about the, the words of a wise man or the words of a fool. And we looked last week and we took the first point and made the first point the fountain of our words. We realized that uh, our words have a, a place of origination if you were out in a, a, a farm country, in fact, if you walk right out the end of the door, Dad showed me here just before church, at, uh, out the end door and right across the street, right beside the road, it looks like a, a fountain coming up out of the ground. I don't know if there's a water line that's ruptured or something on the other side of the street, but there's water just coming up out of the ground under a lot of pressure, a lot of water bubbling up out of the ground. And uh, if you looked at some other places, maybe some farms, you'd find an artesian well where somewhere deep under the earth there's a, there's a source of water and it finds its way up and comes out and overflows. Uh, our words have a source. And the Bible tells us it's our heart. Out of the heart come forth the issues of life. We, we looked into God's word, and uh, God's word helps us to see and to understand that in chapter 12 of Matthew, that uh, it's from the heart of a man uh, that uh, our, uh, our words will flow out. And whatever our hearts are like, that's what our words will be like. And they'll either be good or they'll be foolish. And uh, so we, we saw how important it is to get a grip on this, this, this thing called our hearts at a very early age. Uh, we gave you a verse of scripture, uh, Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 15, how uh, that uh, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. And as children, we make some very foolish decisions, very foolish mistakes because of, uh, of the foolishness bound up in our hearts. We have to drive away that foolishness so that, so that foolishness isn't, isn't the source through which children make decisions and choices. We have to teach them and show them the way of God and the wisdom of God. And it's like a fountain flowing up in our lives that comes from our, our heart uh, and comes out in our words. And uh, we need to be sure that out of our heart, uh, come forth the things of a wise man as we yield our heart and life to the Lord. But let's look at a second thought. Not only do we see the fountain of our words, but uh, a new thought. We see uh, that we need the fear of God in our words. We need the fear of God in our words. Notice what it says about the words of a wise man in, in chapter 10 and verse 12. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. 
Mark that word, gracious. Gracious. The words of a wise man are gracious. A wise man's words will be gracious words. If you go on to read verse 13, it says, The beginning of the words of his mouth, he's talking now about a fool, the beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness. And the end of his talk is mischievous madness. A wise man's mouth, the words that flow forth from his heart, are going to be gracious words. But from the heart of a fool are going to come forth words. Uh, and, uh, and the Bible says his words uh, will, uh, will begin in foolishness, but the end of them will be mischievous madness. You know, uh, the foolish man's words begin in foolishness, but end in mischievous behavior. That's what happens. How does, how does these truths affect our lives? Well, we all would be honest and say, you know, there's been times uh, we do something, and after it's over with, we think, how did I ever do that? How did I ever let that happen? I, I, I can't believe I said that. I, I, you know, how, how did I wind up there? How did that thing go there? We wonder, how did it get to that point? Well, uh, look at verse 14 of chapter 10 of Ecclesiastes. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him. Uh, who can tell? Uh, uh, foolish people, we talk too much. Foolish people talk too much. And uh, you, you can't tell them anything. You can't tell them anything that they don't already know. And I'll tell you what, if you talk about something or let it linger in your mind long enough, it'll turn from talk and, and thought to action. And before long, you wonder, how did that happen? How did I do that, say that, go there, participate in that? It's because we entertained it foolishly. We let it get in our mind until it, it got a grip in there. And, and as we've been talking about our enemy, the devil, uh, he, he builds up strongholds in our mind through vain imaginations and thoughts until we entertain that thought long enough or we talk about it long enough. We got to either prove it and do it or not. And too often times we wound up proving it and doing it. The foolish thoughts and words churn to mischievous madness and decisions that we regret. Verse number 15 says, The labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them because he knoweth not how to go to the city. You try to direct, uh, a fool tries to direct everybody else, but it's obvious they can't find their own way to town. But they're trying to tell everybody else how to go. We're talking about the fool and the characteristics of a fool. And there's such a contrast there with the wise man. Hold your place there. Let me turn back and give you a verse you can look at. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 5. The Bible says in Proverbs 1 verse 5, 5, A wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. Now you contrast that with, with the foolish man who who is so full of words, a man cannot tell him what shall be. And the labor of a fool wearieth everyone, because he knoweth not how to go to the city. What a contrast between the wise man and the foolish man. You know, why do we hear so many ridiculous and ludicrous statements made today? Isn't it amazing? You ever hear just someone say something, you say, how in the world could they be so foolish as to say that? Some statement. I tell you, I tell you what. A lot of it is, uh, people. We listen to so many fools. We listen to them, <laughs> and before long, we foolishly start letting the things they say have a foothold in our thought processes. There's some people I don't allow in my house through the TV. <laughs> My wife doesn't watch Oprah. I'm sorry, all you Oprah watchers. We don't watch her at our house. And uh, several others that we don't watch or listen to. And, uh, you know, a fool 
uh, a f- somebody, somebody, to, somebody to find a fool, and uh, uh, they were talking about a television, and uh, they said a television is a fool in a room full of fools. <laughs> a television, a room full of fools sitting there watching some fool on television talk. And, uh, you know, trying to tell everyone else what to think and what to do. And, you know, we have to be careful because we begin to listen to that because the world allows these foolish people to have so much influence on the world. And we begin to take heed to those things. But the fool, uh, the wise man, he gives heed to counsel. He listens to the words of of other wise men, and he heeds counsel, but the fool will not listen. The fool uh, talks too much. The fool uh, directs everyone else's path, but he himself doesn't know which way to go. And, and we're looking at this contrast between the wise man and the foolish man. And uh, we need a fear of God in our words, the fountain of our words. We need, as we, as we share and speak to and teach and discipline and love and communicate with our children they need to hear a fear of God in our words do you know that we fear God I shared with our men we've been we've been studying uh, through our faithful men's fellowship we've been looking at some truths uh, particularly uh, a verse of scripture that we find in uh, the book of Joshua about God instructing his people through Joshua, the men of God. Now now you're crossing into the land I promised you. And you fought well and you've defeated the enemies that we needed to defeat. And now the land is yours. Now it's time to lay down the sword and it's, become, and it's time to become men of God. Fathers and husbands, teachers and parents to your children. It's time to become men of God. And he gave those men some, some, some simple points of, of some principles and characteristics that need to be a part of their life. And we talked this past Saturday uh, about some of these things. And one of the things that God said, you need to cleave unto the Lord your God. Cleave unto him. The word cleave has the idea of clinging to or holding on to. Uh, like glue, we hear that phrase sometimes. But uh, it also, it's a word of, depend, uh, of dependence. We're depending upon God. And, and we shared with our men, uh, you know, one of the things we want to do as a father is we want our children to feel like their father, they can come to us and we can handle any situation and everything that needs to be done. If it's a wheel broken on the bike or uh, if it's a, uh, you know, a board that needs fixed in the treehouse or whatever it is, we can take care of it. We can handle it. You can come to me. I'm your father. You can come to me. I'll fix it. I'll take care of it. But you know what? Ultimately, our role, though, as fathers, and I told our men this, it's that we don't stop short there, but we have to go the next mile, and we have to let our children know that the one they're depending in and depending on is depending in and depending on our Heavenly Father. And ultimately, I'm not the end all, but God, our Heavenly Father, is the end all. And He's the one we ultimately look to. He's the one that that dad, who you can depend on, is depending on. And yes, I'm going to do everything I can, but I can't do anything without the Lord. We We have to teach our children this. We have to help them to see that. And uh, that's, this, is, uh, this is where we have to have the fear of God in our words, the things we say. When we're, sh- when we're speaking with our, with our wife and we're sharing with our children or whatever it may be, those that, we ha- those, those that we have influence, those that are within our circle of influence, our words need to have the fear of God upon them. You want to you wanna, uh, you wanna have an impact on the people you work with? Don't be foolishly spouting off out all the time everything you think and every opinion you have and every thought that crosses your mind. My grandfather told me, he told me you can, you can be quiet and people might think you're a fool, but you can open your mouth all the time and they'll know you're a fool. My grandfather didn't spout off all the time, but when he had something to say, it was worth listening to. And it was always tainted with 
the fear of God. You won't have an influence on the people you're trying to influence where you work or whatever. Don't, don't always throw out your opinion. And by the way, opinions are highly overrated. <laughs> In the end, my opinion doesn't mean anything. It's the truth of God's word, and it's the fact that I am willing to submit to the way of God. And, and we're not always spouting off or giving our two cents worth. No, but what we can do is when we do speak, we can speak and our words have the fear of God. That will influence people. That's very different than the world, isn't it? The fear of God in our words, the fountain of our words. Let me just give you this last one. The force of our words. The force. We know words are a very powerful thing. Job chapter 6. We spoke about him a little bit Sunday in the message. Is we know that God's work is greater than the devil's work. The devil went to work in Job's life, but in the end, God's work was greater than the devil's work. And in the end, Job's life was, was more blessed by God and, and, uh, and than it had been in the beginning, even though the devil had done a terrible work. God's work was a greater work. Job chapter 6. Let me read you a couple verses of Scripture. Job 6, verse 24. Job says, Teach me and I'll hold my tongue and cause me to understand wherein I have erred. How forcible are right words. But what doth your arguing reprove? How forceful are right words. Remember the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. The word grace, we're saved by grace through faith. Somebody, somebody put, took the word grace and alliterated it. Uh, they took and used every letter in the word grace to make a statement or to write out a word talking about salvation. And they used the letters G-R-A-C-E and they said grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. God gave us everything. Salvation is not free. It costs God his precious son. That was the price for our sin. But it is a free gift. Gifts can be given, but gifts can be very expensive for the purchaser. But they don't cost you anything because it's a gift. But they were not free. And our salvation was at the expense of God's greatest, His greatest treasure, His precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God's riches at Christ's expense the words of a, of a wise man's words, his words are gracious. But his words are forceful. Forceful. Not coarse. Not necessarily loud. Not brass. Not bullying with our words. That's not what God is saying that about words being forceful. There goes our microphone. First time today though, so that's good. But... But, uh, but right words are forceful words. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know about men who profess to know the Lord and be walking under the shadow of the wings of the Lord, and yet their, their words are so coarse and their spirit is so argumentative. And it seems like they're wanting to be so forceful and bully their way into everything and every situation and circumstance they're in. Say they're Christian and Christ-like. I believe wise words are forceful, but they're gracious. Wise words are forceful, but they're gracious. Let's look at some things. Psalm 45. Psalm 45, verse number 2. Psalm 45 and verse 2. The Bible says, <clears throat> I just begin in the first verse. My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Now, this is what we call a messianic psalm. In other words, this psalm was written and it is a psalm directly related to describing the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we read this, we're reading a description God's mind, God's mind, how he sees his son, the Lord Jesus, when he looks upon him. And he says, thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. 
Therefore, God has blessed thee forever. He's talking about his son, his son, the Lord Jesus. He's saying that, that into his lips has been poured grace. Grace, the, the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. His words were words of grace. You go to the New Testament, we read the gospel records of the life and ministry of the Lord in this world. In Luke chapter 4, uh, we go to verse number 16. Luke 4, let me just read this particular passage here. Luke 4 verse 16. The Bible says in the 16th verse, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Verse 20, and he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him and began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Is not this Joseph's son? Now what the Lord did was he went into the synagogue and the Bible said it was his custom to do that. In other words, when they had church and the doors were open, he was there. He's our example. And he got the book of Isaiah and opened it up and he, he read from a portion of the book of Isaiah. You can go and you can read it yourself. It's in Isaiah chapter, uh, it's in Isaiah chapter let's see here, chapter uh, sixty. Uh, 61, Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2, this is where he read. Isaiah 61, verse 1 said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, to the opening of the prison, to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. But now if you go to your Bible and read Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2, you're going to notice he stopped halfway through verse 2. And that verse concluded with these words, And the day of vengeance of our God. He didn't say that in the New Testament. Why? Because at this point in Luke chapter 4, his words were gracious words. He came to offer Israel their Messiah. He came as the Christ, the Son of God, the Anointed One. And he was looking to them in, to embrace him as who he was. And he was speaking to them in grace. And he did not speak about the vengeance of God, the judgment, the wrath of God. Although later on he would. And although later on this second half of that verse will be fulfilled. But here he stopped. Right in the middle, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's what he preached. His, his words were such gracious words to those people. And uh, they listened to him. Now this was, this was one of the great, this was, this, this, was one of the, this was the greatest preacher ever to walk on planet earth. And, and his words, his words had the power to bring grown men to their knees. You remember in the garden when they came to arrest him and, and, and he simply spoke the words, I am. The word Jehovah, God in the Hebrew, I am. You seeking Jesus? I am. I am God. And the very words he spoke sent those men to their knees. And he waited for them to regain themselves and get back up so he could offer himself so that he could be taken captive because that was the plan and the will of God. It was the hour that he came into the world. He, he, spoke, he spoke with such power, the authority and power. Never a man, the Bible said, spake like this man. Never a man spoke with such authority. And yet always his words were gracious words. 
There's a difference. I hope I, I hope I don't ever, I hope I don't ever, and I know there's times I fail, there's times my words might be touched with anger, something, some, some, something motivating what I'm saying, but by the grace of God, I want what I'm preaching to be preached with grace, even though it may be forceful. God's word is forceful. God's word is divisive. God's word cuts right to the quick, to the core, to the heart of men, piercing our heart. And God's word must be preached. And all the counsel of God must be preached. But I think we must preach it with grace. With grace. Our words touch with grace. As the Lord did. Forceful words, but gracious words. The Lord's words, they were authoritative. They were powerful. They were life-changing. But they were gracious they were helping words. They were healing words. They were gracious words. And the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious words. Gracious words. The fountain of our words. The fear of God must be in our words. And the force of our words. When we, when we, when, when we speak our words, truth, the truth of God's word, we must be speaking with grace. Grace to the hearer. And yet God's word is a very forceful word. God's word can do the work of a hammer striking a stone. But we preach with the grace of God for the hearts of men. It's the grace of God that leadeth men to repentance, isn't it? And we speak with words that are gracious words. The words of a wise man's mouth. We're going to stop right there. That will finish up that thought. And then when we meet again, uh, we'll continue right on and move right ahead into the next part there, the next passage, and uh, we'll look in. Uh, we only have two chapters left in Ecclesiastes, and we'll be finished with that and uh, be moving ahead then on to something else. But we're thankful for you coming tonight. Appreciate everybody being here. We do hope for everybody uh, being uh, safe as you travel home. Uh, this time of night on a dark road, it's hard to tell if that's just a little bit of water on the road or if that's a big hole full of water. So be careful. And... Uh, and uh, remember where you are. Most of us know our way home pretty well. And we know where we need to be careful. So watch out for those things. And if you do have to cross a bridge or something like that where there are creeks, they could be up. They could be pretty high. And don't want to get into any trouble that way. But we're thankful for God's goodness to us. Be about the work of the Lord now. Uh, from tomorrow all the way through uh, Sunday, inviting men and women, boys and girls to Sunday school and church, sharing a gospel track with uh, boldness and grace, uh, witnessing for the Lord. And uh, be sure to use Sunday school as an evangelistic tool to invite people who have never been saved to hear the gospel of their salvation. Grace come, uh, We're saved by grace through faith, and faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of God, and uh, God will do that work if we'll help people to hear his word. So be about these things. If you'd like to come out and, and go visiting or be a part of our bus ministry, uh, we meet at 10 o'clock on uh, Saturdays. But let's pray together, and we'll be finished today. We always remind people on Wednesday nights, if you're here and you've never received Christ as your Savior, we invite you to stay after the service is over, and uh, let us take God's word and talk to you from the scripture show you what it means to be saved. But let's pray. Father, we are thankful people. We ask God your blessings now as our folks uh, dismiss and head back to their homes. Uh, Lord, we know you're in control of the weather and the rain, so help everybody get in their cars and get home safely. Lord, help us to be about your work of these next few days. Help our words, God, to, uh, to realize, Lord, that the fountain of our words as they flow out, God, may it come from, uh, Lord, a point, a place in our hearts and lives that's God, from your wisdom and your word, uh, Lord, we pray that, uh, Father, we would uh, realize, God, that uh, our words need to, need to resonate with a fear of God in our lives. And, Lord, we pray that, Father, you'd help our words to be filled with grace uh, to those that we speak to. And, Lord, we just pray now you'd just bless these folks, meet their needs. Thank you for them. Thank you for using them in the ministry of this local church. And, God, we pray you'd help us to grow in a way that pleases you to reach men and women, boys and girls. And we'll thank you for all these things tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.